<laughs> hey there, Maximum Mayhammers. We're back with episode 4. We've been off recording a bunch of new multiplayer Stormworks battle content with the SS Dixon. Over the next few weeks, we'll be cutting together the footage recorded by myself, Lex, and Crazy to bring you an epic Stormworks battle and sinkings. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and bell notification icon so you don't miss out. Also, if you have any tips on recording Discord audio, please let me know in the comments. In this episode, we'll be working on outfitting and detailing the interior, adding radar and navigation systems, as well as painting the entire ship. You'll see over four hours of work condensed into eh, 15 minutes or so, with tips and tricks I learned along the way. Okay, at the end of the last episode, our ship was suffering from non-floatitis. We can easily solve this by reducing the size of the crude oil tanks, increasing the amount of air inside the hull, and ultimately making the ship more buoyant. It would be hard for it to be less buoyant, if we're perfectly honest. When doing this work, it's really important to make sure you completely seal off the fluid area, or the fluid spawner will just flood the entire ship. A one block opening can easily result in a ship that just sinks to the bottom of the ocean. While we're in the tanks, we'll also add some fluid meters so that we can measure their capacity in the future. This ship is definitely looking better, but the bow of the ship is still sitting lower in the water than I'd like, which is to say, under the water. Now we'll reduce the size of our jet fuel tanks. I'm being extra careful here to make sure that there are no openings since it's very easy to have gaps when working on sloped sides. And it looks like I made an opening and accidentally made the problem worse. Back into the editor, I found the hole we missed before. Perfect. Now we know where the ship will sit in the water when carrying the maximum amount of fuel. I use this location to mark off the maximum water line on the sides of the ship. We'll be adding a series of markings on the ship's side to measure the water line using the paintable sign blocks. Setting the crude oil tanks to 0% full allows us to quickly find the minimum water line as well. It looks like my paintable signs don't go nearly far enough down the sides of the ship. This really gives a great indication of just how much crude oil this ship can carry. mark out the minimum draft and quickly decide to change to a blue paint scheme versus the traditional red. I really like the look of this dark blue and decide to make a custom lighter blue to coordinate with it. The area of the freeboard that dips down for loading will mark out with a checkerboard of safety orange and black. Now I continue around the ship painting the freeboard and stairs the lighter blue color. I think it stands out nicely against the white. Normally on a ship, the stack where our jet engine's intakes are would be the exhaust, so I painted the top and insides black to simulate years of collected soot. Mmm, pollution. From here I went with a lighter gray stripe and then back to our custom blue color. Popping inside the ship shows that the paint bucket tool went a bit crazy, but I actually like the blue floor. I just have to correct some overspray on the underside of the bridge. I cover the deck in a nice brown that complements with the blue and the orange. Already the ship's looking so much better as we get rid of the plain white sections. The area of the ship that will always be submerged is painted in a traditional anti-fouling red paint. Stormworks has a known bug where paint isn't always applied correctly when in mirror mode on angled surfaces. So I have to repeat the work on both sides, but with the paint bucket tool, I make quick work of it. 
This is the point in the build where I really felt the ship was coming together. Now we can jump back to the paintable signs and start marking out the depth markings. Nothing crazy here, just a series of long and short lines to simulate the markings found on cargo ships. Painting these is harder than it could be if there was just a bit more refinement from the depths. For example, the bucket tool aren't supported, so you actually have to fill in every single little block. Also, these blocks aren't mirrored properly so that you have to do the work twice. This is, in general, a great representation of Stormworks. An idea is implemented and it's like 90% there, but then never has the final polish that would make things just a bit easier. It's like, hey, check out the shiny thing. Okay, I'm bored working on this thing, let me make a new shiny thing. Come look at that. That being said, I still really enjoy the game. It's just not as successful as it could be. Spawning in the ship shows that I too uh, have the same problem. I'm like, oh, let me add some lines down the ship. Yeah, that's good enough. They almost reach, they'll get the idea. Now let's take the ship out for a test drive. handles really well for such a large ship and it should make trips to the Arctic a breeze. Okay, listen, I just can't do it. The length of the ladder and the markings are, are they're just not right. The ladder's too long and the markings are too short. We'll make some quick work of it and feel better with a much polished ship. Using the selection tool, we can quickly copy our existing painted blocks and paste them into the hole. While we have the markings in the clipboard, we'll quickly paste them onto the other side as well. Don't forget to merge the pasted elements back into the ship or the ship will no longer be watertight and pieces will drop off. I've had this happen. Huh. <sighs> see, see devs, that's what it's like to go ahead and give it that final little bit of polish. One thing I always see on tanker ships is a very large no smoking sign. We can replicate that with paint on the outside of our bridge. I started with some blocks to rough out how the layers would look and quickly realized that the S is never going to work. We're going to have to use paintable blocks again. To save some time, I used paint on the regular blocks to start mapping out the general size of the letters as well as the letter spacing. I then put paintable indicators on each of these blocks. The difference between paintable signs and paintable indicators is that paintable indicators can light up and require electric connections. Now it's just a matter of painting the letters onto the blocks. It's really important to select the additive mode on your paintbrush, otherwise the blocks won't light up. You'll know you're doing it right if the paint has a glow effect as you're applying it. I save a bit of time by copying the O in the N. <sighs> There's nothing there. That's because we painted what the sign should look like when switched on, not what it should like when switched off. Back into the editor, and this time we use normal paint. This work goes pretty quickly since we can trace the outline of the letters that we've already made. I again copy the O and N to save a bit of time, then merge everything together. Perfect! Now the letters show up. While we are painting text, it's time to name the ship. I really didn't want to go through the hassle of paintable signs again, so I decided to make some 5x3 block letters. The name SS Dixon just popped into my mind. I've been told that SS is only for steamships, but you know, I'm okay with that. There's nothing else about this ship that's remotely realistic. Now we can move on to lighting. I quickly grab a bunch of different light types for the ship and start placing the navigation lights, starting with a white light at the bow and then two marker lights on both sides. 
squad some lights under the bridge to light up the deck. Mini spotlights are perfect here. Then we'll add a support and one big spotlight at the top. I continue around the ship putting lights where I think they should be, like on the top of the mast, the rear of the ship, the openings of the freeboard, blah blah blah, you get it, lights, lights, lights. Switching to additive mode in paint allows us to quickly color the lights, green on the left side or port, and red on the right side or starboard. I use amber on the deck lights to simulate that nice warm glow of sodium lamps. Mmm, sodium. Then I add some lights next to each of the pumps so that eventually I can light them up green or red based on if they are pumping or not. As I was staring at the hull, I realized it could use a helipad for easy rescue and refueling operations. Using some paint, I quickly created a large H surrounded by the checkerboard warning pattern. Around the outside, I added a series of ropes and rope anchors so that we could easily tie down a helicopter to the deck of the ship. A set of landing lights completes the helipad and our work on the outside of the ship. Now we move on to the interior detailing and equipment. Knowing that the ship is designed to operate in the Arctic, I begin by adding heaters to the ship as well as Arctic equipment. A fire extinguisher and first aid supplies as well as a welder completes the equipment in the passenger section. From here I switch back to interior lighting, using the cutaway view and mirror mode to quickly add lighting to the ceiling of each compartment. We'll tie these lights to player sensors so that the lights automatically turn on when a player approaches, eliminating the need for a lot of switches. What's really nice with the player sensors is that you can adjust the sensitivity. Under the medical base, I add in first aid kits, defibrillators, and fire extinguishers. On my ship, you can never have too many fire extinguishers. Strobe lights, beacon locators, and oxygen masks complete the equipment loadout for the medical base. It all fits neatly underneath the medical beds. Due to the ever-present risk of fire on the ship, I then add a series of firefighting outfits and fire extinguishers on the outside, and painted these areas in bright red. We should now be prepared for any emergency or rescue operation we may encounter. Adding hatches and ladders will allow us to reach the interior of the ship and patch potential megalodon holes or put out burning fuel tanks. With that work done, we can return to the bridge, adding a series of lights to the ceiling and another player sensor. Lights and player sensors go into the crew quarters as well. I hope they like to sleep with the lights on. Now we can use the space under the beds to add heaters and more equipment. Both normal and underwater welders will come in handy as we're out in the open seas, as well as flares and flare guns. Adding in arctic and firefighting gear will allow the crew to quickly prepare for any emergency. A final check and a few more lights and player sensors make sure that the entire ship will be perfectly lit up. Now we can add ladders and railings to the top of the ship so that we can repair the sensor and mast if necessary. I tried orange, then gray, before finally settling on white for these topmost railings. Turning our attention to the ship's electrical systems, I rough out the shape of an electric panel where we can monitor the state of the battery's charge as well as our electrical generation. We could do this with a microcontroller and displays, but I prefer the look of old school dials. Combined with the thralls to control the jet turbine and clutches, this panel looks like something straight out of Frankenstein's lab. It's alive! I paint the electric generation area of the panel bright yellow to distinguish it from the other dials. Now the ever so fun part of connecting all of the electric together. I, just, I wish there was a button just to auto connect everything. Clicking hundreds of plus signs is not how I necessarily like to spend my time. Luckily, you only have to do it once, unless you make changes to your ship. Nah, who would ever do that? Next, we need to connect the readouts and controls for the jet engines. I covered this in episode two, so I'll skip through that explanation again, and instead you can clicky clicky on the link to the tutorial. One trick for hooking up lights as well as backlights for gauges is to use my everything on microcontroller. The link is in the description. Just connect everything you want to control at once to this one microcontroller, and then one input switch to it. This way you can change your bridge design, add more controls, and continue to make updates without ever having to reconnect all of the lights together all over again. 
Finally, we can use two workshop items, radar and autopilot map displays, to begin building out our navigation system. I've included links to both of these microcontrollers in the description. They both work with 5x3 displays. Hooking them up is pretty simple, just passing data from the radar, GPS, and compass sensors. I've also added some buttons to turn on our emergency beacon as well as beacon locator. From here we can hide the microcontroller and add some equipment like night vision binoculars to the cabin. Okay, I want to find out how fast this ship really is, so let's add a digital display. For fluid tanks, I like to use these gauges that support a primary and secondary value. I use the tank capacity as the main value and the current fluid level as a secondary value. I'll just add four gauges, one for each of the tanks on the right side wall for now, so that we can monitor the crude oil level when visiting the oil there. The same display is used to monitor our own jet fuel. Adding a throttle to each side of the helm will allow us to control engine speed as well as the amount of clutch engagement. Now if we connected the linear speed sensor directly to the digital display, the display would show meters per second. Instead, I've created a quick microcontroller called meters to knots that will display our speed in knots per hour. You can download this and all of the other microcontrollers that I create from the Stormworks workshop. Complete the electric and data connections and we can take the ship out onto the water. That's it for now. Join us next time as we attempt our first crude oil run. Click the subscribe and notification button to make sure that you're notified as soon as it becomes available. As always, thanks for watching and cause as much mayhem as you can.